And what's really sad about this is this sort of normalization, this kind of trying to make everything feel normal and natural and doing it at a very young age. Do you know who else uses that method? Pedophiles and sex traffickers. When a pedophile is trying to groom a child to the point to where they will be able to use them sexually, but the child won't tell anybody or isn't going to, you know, in any way reveal or talk about the things that they're doing or it won't, you know, the, the parents won't notice a change in the child, which they almost always do eventually, but they, they try to normalize it and slowly build up and gradually groom children to think that this behavior is something that is normal. Hey, fellow tacticians, be sure to like this video and subscribe and ring that little notification bell that supports this channel's conservative content, which is good for me, good for you, good for America, but really bad for the dark cyber overlords at YouTube. One of the things that is frustrating is that the leftists just bombard you with crap on Pride Month. And as much as it is annoying, and it is annoying, it, it bothers me. I, but at the end of the day, it's not that big a deal. It doesn't really affect my life that much. I mean, am I annoyed when I'm watching whatever streaming service I'm watching and every single freaking commercial break is some kind of ode to Pride Month? Yeah, it bugs me, but it doesn't ruin my life. I can live with it, and I'm an adult, and I know it's crap, and so it's a little obnoxious, but ads are obnoxious anyway, so it doesn't really affect me all that much. What does get under my skin is when they use Pride Month as an excuse to push their agenda with people that don't know better, that aren't adults like I am. And of course, what I'm talking about is that they use this as an opportunity to push the agenda onto children. And one such example of this comes from Blue's Clues. It's a popular children's show. Now, I was a little too old for Blue's Clues, and my family also didn't have cable. So back when it used to come on Nickelodeon, I didn't see it because I was too old for it, and we didn't have cable anyway. So a lot of people got very upset about this, partly because of nostalgia. And I totally understand that. That's reasonable. You know, a show that you watched as a kid now pushing an evil secularist agenda as opposed to just being entertainment for little kids. I, I get that, but I don't really have that emotional attachment to it. I have the emotional attachment to the kids and people trying to use this as an excuse to sexualize children. But I'm just saying that the show itself, I, I really bear no loyalty to. And I think that kind of gives me the advantage of looking at it slightly more objectively than somebody that remembers it fondly. But you have to remember that Blue's Clues is a show that is primarily marketed to children between the ages of three and five. So we're not even talking about like preteens or even, you know, maybe third graders, kids that are a little bit older and can understand a little bit more nuance. No, we're talking about very, very young children, toddlers and like the post toddler era before they even go to school. That's the age group that we're talking about when we're talking about Blue's Clues. And this particular episode featured a sing-along by drag performer Nina West, who apparently was a favorite on RuPaul's Drag Race. I don't know, it's some kind of reality show. I did a little research on it. Apparently AOC has been on it, which I thought was weird. Um, you know, AOC has her flaws, but she's not a drag queen. But I guess she was there to endorse them. I don't know. But anyway, so this is a person that is on reality TV and is well known as a drag queen. And so they, they bring a transvestite onto the cartoon and, and they, that person lends the voice to the cartoon version of themselves being depicted on the show. And you'll see what I'm talking about. Just watch this clip. The character actually goes to a gay pride parade and performs a sing-along for kids to sing with. It's time for a pride parade. Families marching one by one, hurrah, hurrah. Families marching one by one, hurrah, hurrah. This family has two mommies. They love each other so proudly. And they all go marching in the big parade. Families marching two by two, hurrah. All right, so before we cut away from this, I want you to notice something. And there's a reason I'm leaving that frozen frame up the very front of the float that they're at right now, they have a little gay pride flag that also has a clenched fist on it. You look at the rabbit hopping along the side, he's also carrying a flag that has a clenched fist on it. And this is important for a couple of reasons. But 
as evil and horrific as the the gay pride and shoving that down your kids' throats is. And, and I think that that's the worst of what we're going to look at today. I want to take just a quick second and to look at that flag that has the clenched fist because this is not merely a moral thing. This is also heavily political and the clenched fist is actually fantastic evidence for that because if you notice that fist flag on the float, that is not an arbitrary symbol. That is something that has been used for a really, really long time, and it is a symbol of socialism. So you're not just getting sexual preferences and you know homosexuality shoved down your kid's throat if you're having them watch this show. You're also getting a healthy dose of socialism as well. This particular symbol has been a part of socialist lingo and symbology for a really long time. This is an article from National Geographic. And it says one of the earliest known instances in the U.S. of a protester brandishing the raised fist occurred in 1913 when Big Bill Haywood spoke to strikers during the Patterson Silk Strike in New Jersey. Haywood, a founding member of the Union Industrial Workers of the World, preaching working class solidarity across all races and trades. And so that's really important. The Industrial Workers of the World, or what it later became to be known, International Workers of the World, which again, became a, a slogan, International Workers of the World Unite, that, that whole thing. Um, that has been a, a rallying cry for socialist dogma for a really long time. This has a very, very old history, and we're not going to go into all the details. That would take way too long and is way beyond this, the scope. But just to prove my point that this is a socialist symbol, here's a few tidbits of history to help you understand how old and, and how symbolic this is. So this is a, as you can see, a clenched fist. It's, it's supposed to be the fist of solidarity from the industrial workers of the world, from the Solidarity newspaper, which was published June 30, 1917. So you can see they, they talked about the very first instance of it being 1913. Just five years later, this thing was in socialist propaganda pieces as a symbol for the industrial workers of the world from 1917. Now, fast forward just a little bit, 1920, Chicago, you can see the clenched fist was used as a symbol there for rallying for, again, the industrial workers of the world. You can see the IWW thing there. You can see, this is, again, from that same National Geographic article, you can see those pictures of people doing the clenched fist. And I want you to read the bottom part for the picture on the left. It says, in 1936, a Parisian crowd demonstrates support for the Popular Front, a coalition of socialist, communist, and other fascist organizations. So again, we see socialists that have adopted this symbol. All right, this is several different versions of the clinch fist being used by the students for a democratic society. And you can see that all through the years, those first two were from the 60s. I think the publication is from maybe the late 60s, early 70s. And you see the iteration of that symbol being used by the students of democratic society over and over again. Now, that may sound benign on its surface, but this is a very radical group. They had ties to the Weather Underground back in the 60s, which was an actual terrorist organization that bombed the Capitol building. And by bombed, I don't mean like what happened on January 6th, where they stormed the Capitol, went in, saw some stuff, put their feet up on a desk and walked out. I mean, they literally blew up part of the Capitol. And people were injured. Like, th this is a actual terrorist organization that had that SDS had ties to. Wildly socialist. And they're using the same symbol. And so this is not something that would be unfamiliar to the left of today either. And then this is something that they're using. They continue to use this symbol even today. You can see on the far left there from the 1960s, that's the Black Panthers doing the clenched fist salute. You can see that they still use it with Black Lives Matter just from, I believe that one was from last year. The mural with all the clenched fist. And then you can see there at the bottom, that's at an Antifa protest that happened last year. And so Antifa, Black Lives Matter, all of these different socialist communities coming together. And you may also notice that back in the 1936 picture that we showed that it was talking about communist, socialist, and anti-fascist, that's talking about the original Antifa. So this goes back a really long time. And this also goes to illustrate that 
a lot of people would try to look at this if they were arguing for having something like this. Like, well, Blue's Clues is really just trying to, they're, they're not being political. They're just trying to teach kids that being gay is okay. Well, okay, I have my problems with that too, but it's also overtly political. They're trying to send in political messages and condition children as young as two and as old as five to think like them and to grow up to be somebody that is a political ally of theirs. This is a political process. Make no mistake. I mean, we would be upset if we saw, for example, a swastika or a sickle and hammer in a kid's show, or at least I, I would hope that we would. The clenched fist is no different. It is a symbol that has ties to terrorist organizations and radical political groups of the left and has for about a hundred years now. And so, well, actually over a hundred years since it started in 1913. So make no mistake, they are trying to push morals on your kid, but they're also trying to push political agendas on your kid. But moreover than that, the fact that this happens at a pride parade is not insignificant. Have you ever actually been to a pride parade? I'm guessing most of the people in my audience haven't. And granted, I haven't been to one in person because I wasn't able to make it. I had planned to go to one in Birmingham and, and wasn't. I was only able to watch it online. These are not family-friendly events. And so they depict the Pride Parade and the kids' show. It's horribly unrealistic. And weirdly enough, the dolphins and beavers and bears and crocodiles in it, that's actually the most realistic thing of what uh, a Pride Parade looks like because there are a bunch of freaks dressed up like animals. But if you've ever actually been to one, it is not family friendly at all. I mean, there are men walking around with basically, I mean, literally just wearing socks on their junk, not even wearing underwear, just walking around stark naked with nothing but like some, some kind of sock device strapped around their stuff. So they're not technically naked, but they really are. I mean, you can see their butt, everything. They're there's little to the imagination. You see guys walking around in bondage stuff, leather straps. Uh, in, in the one in Birmingham that I was watching, they had a, a guy that was walking around with a crown made of sex toys. I mean, this is horrendously creepy stuff that I don't even think should be allowed in public for adults, much less having a bunch of little kids there and singing about it and riding on the floats in the parade. That's simply not something that should ever happen, even if you agree with the gay agenda, you should be able to get on board with the fact that this is not a thing that is designed for children to be at or to be family friendly in any way. And unfortunately, that's not the worst of it. This sing-along actually continues to get worse. And this is the second clip of that. Watch. Families marching four by four, hurrah, hurrah. Families marching four by four, hurrah! And you see, we're going to zoom in here. This is the most disturbing part of the video, in my opinion, because you'll notice that right before we zoomed in, it was a whole family of beavers. And now that we've zoomed in, it's we're zooming in on the youngest or the youngest looking beaver. I know it's a cartoon beaver, so you can't really tell the age. But it's the smallest, and it's obviously the one that's trying to be depicted as a child. So unless you're like, knee deep in this crap like I am every day. You may not fully understand the symbolism here, so I'm going to walk you through it. You see that like light blue and then pink and white strap on the beaver's arm? That particular color scheme is supposed to be the symbol for trans. And if you'll notice, on the beaver's chest, there are what appear to be scars just sort of rigid protrusions where the breast would normally be. And by the way, this particular, I had to stop it here so that you could actually see this part of it, but this clip goes on to talk about how this particular family is trans and they love each other proudly or some, you know, leftist gobbledygook like that. So they're very specifically trying to depict this family as trans, and they even say that later in the clip. But if you look at that part of the beaver's chest, none of the other beavers have that. It's only on this one, who is also happens to be the youngest member of this beaver family. And what that's actually supposed to be depicting, if you understand the symbolism here, 
is that is a child that has undergone transition surgery to remove their breasts. That's what that's supposed to represent. I wish I was making this up, but I'm not. And this only happens on that one beaver out of the beaver family of five, which means that that's not like just a, a way that they animated that particular animal. It's specific to that one. And they picked the youngest child in the group and they picked the family that's supposed to represent the trans family in the parade. They are literally signaling to little kids that it is normal and natural and not something to be ashamed of to cut off your own body parts and have them surgically removed, have your body surgically altered as a child in order to transition from the gender you were born with. That's the messaging that they're sending out to two to five-year-olds. That's a level of, of evil and manipulation that, I, I mean, I don't even understand getting that deep into it. But, but this is what is being spoon-fed to your kids. And I think that because I, I talk to all kinds of people across the political spectrum that you really need to understand what they're doing here in this emphasis on families. And they say the word family like 10,000 times in this sing-along. The only, I think the only word they use more than family is proud or proudly, but they're talking about, Oh, this, this is a family. And, and this dad has, this family has two dads. This family has two moms. This family is transgender. This family is non-binary. This family has like uh, three dads, a watermelon and a great aunt. Like, I, I mean, they're they're trying to say no all this is normal all this is natural it's all subjective there is no right or wrong there is no family structure that is preferable and so it's a slap in the face to the nuclear family and that is the intended goal by the way like we just mentioned the clenched fist that is a symbol of socialism but it has also been co-opted as we showed by black lives matter and what is one of black lives matter's goal to destroy the nuclear family that's in their platform on their website. Or it was, they took it down, but I have a copy of it. That was something that was a part of their official platform. They're all working in tandem. This is all about socialism. This is all about pushing the socialist agenda by destroying the most basic building block of society, the family. That's what we're dealing with here. And ultimately, that should come as no surprise, because if they can get you to reject the most basic thing about who you are, I mean, what's the first thing that they determine about you when you come out of the womb? Is it a boy or a girl? If they can get you to reject the most basic part of your identity and say, nope, it doesn't matter that, that I'm a boy, I'm actually a girl. If they can get you to do that, they can get you to reject anything, no matter how basic, no matter how fundamental, no matter how obvious. You will just accept whatever they feed you, regardless of whether it makes any sense or not. And that's what we're dealing with right now. That's the level of evil that is being fed to the kids. And that's how they're trying to normalize it. And what's really sad about this is this sort of normalization, this kind of trying to make everything feel normal and natural and doing it at a very young age. Do you know who else uses that method? Pedophiles and sex traffickers. When a pedophile is trying to groom a child to the point to where they will be able to use them sexually, but the child won't tell anybody or isn't going to, you know, in any way reveal or talk about the things that they're doing, or it won't, you know, the, the parents won't notice a change in the child, which they almost always do eventually, but they, they try to normalize it and slowly build up and gradually groom children to think that this behavior is something that is normal for a little kid to behave in. And that's the way that they train kids to be able to use them for themselves or to tr train them to use them as sex slaves. This is something that you can ask anybody that works with kids like this. I've, I've, you know, I've worked with charities that do this. I'm not an expert in it myself, but I've talked to people that are, that do this for a living, that specifically go out and try to uh, free children from sex traffic, that, that work with the, the government on, on doing sting operations like that. And they say the same thing every single time. The way that they do it is they slowly build the kid into where they think this is what's supposed to happen, what's supposed to be normal. And so Blue's Clues trying to normalize this whole thing and be like, 
oh yeah, having two dads, having two moms, having your breast cut off because you think that you're a boy, even though you're a girl, it's all totally normal. It's totally natural. See how proud everybody is. See how happy everybody is. See, it's all fine. Don't worry about it. They're, they're grooming kids through the TV the same way that pedophiles and sex traffickers do. That's what we're dealing with, guys. Make no mistake about it. It's the same kind of thinking. It's the same kind of evil. This is usually the part of the video where I ask you to like this video and subscribe to my show and click the notification bell. Does that guarantee you're going to get notifications when I post new content? Honestly, the way that YouTube censors conservatives, I really doubt it. But you know what liking and subscribing does do for sure? It ticks off the dark cyber overlords at Google when they see those likes and subscriptions despite shadow banning my conservative content. So you really should like and subscribe, if nothing else, just to stick it to them.